Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Blab Translators. This is episode number five. Uh, my name is Dmitry Kornyhov. I'm your host. Joining me today, my incredible co-host, Yelena Tereshenkova. Hi, Yelena. Hello. Uh, Blab Translators is the first live talk show about translators and translation. We go live every Wednesday. Uh, this is a talk show where we invite uh, interesting people of our profession and ask them questions about pretty much anything from marketing to uh, uh, translation, uh, diversification, all kinds of interesting stuff. If you want to join us, uh, feel free to visit our website at blabintranslators.com and subscribe to our mailing list. That way you will never miss another episode. Our guest tonight is Paul Irwin. Uh, he's a uh, entrepreneur, he's a, a, he's a podcaster, he's doing a lot of stuff, uh, he has a lot of experience in translation, voiceovers, uh, presenting at conferences, and writing uh, books. So, uh, Paul, over to you, please introduce yourself and tell us a few things about you and your business. Well, thanks very much, Dimitri, fantastic introduction. I run a translation company from here in Bogota, in Colombia where I've been for the last 10 years or so. Um, I had a, a, I used to work in finance. I had an opportunity to come over here and I, used, I worked here in finance before kind of switching back to languages, mm -hmm. which was really my, my first love, if you like. So I've been running a translation company for the last uh, 10 years or so. I actually did my first translation, my first paid translation probably about 20 years ago. Um, so I did do a little bit of work um, ages ago and then sort of came back to it. So that's a little bit about about me running the company from here uh, in, in Colombia, which is a fantastic place to be. Uh, how did you end up living in Colombia? Well, as I said, it was, it was just an opportunity that came out of the blue, really. I was working in the city of uh, London. I was working as a fund manager and I had uh, a, a job that was, I, I would say, sort of became less and less exciting over time. And uh, so when mm -hmm. this opportunity came up to travel to, to Colombia, I thought, wow, you know, this is an opportunity that I'm going to have to take. And I went for it and I came here and I worked in the financial business for a little while. But then I decided that really I wanted to set up my own company and work in languages. So that's what I did. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Did you catch yes. that? So, um, to... okay, so there's something wrong with Dmitry. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, okay. so, so, so um, yeah, I just, uh, I just started, started working in, started working in, in, in languages. I started teaching English. I then hired uh, a, a number of other teachers to work with me. And really, I started doing the same thing in, in translation. I started doing a little mm -hmm. bit of translation myself. And then I got more and more involved in it, more and more. Yeah, I think there's a lot of things at the beginning that you just have no idea about. Certainly, I didn't. Um, yeah, I didn't have any cool. idea, for example, that the American Translators Association Association even existed. <laughs> I had no idea that there were all these wonderful colleagues all over the world. I had no idea that there were groups such as uh, Standing Out on Facebook and things like that. So, so over time, I, I started to get more and more involved and uh, really uh, started to, to, to grow the business. Um, okay, so you said that uh, you hired uh, some teachers for your, for your teaching for your English teaching company. Uh, do you also right, have yeah. do you also have a translation company in the sense of uh, so traditional translation company where you hire people, you hire other translators, or do you work mainly yourself and uh, do outsourcing? How how does it go? Um, yeah, I think it's probably a traditional translation company. I'm not sure exactly what a traditional uh, translation company would be mm -hmm. but you know I, I spend a lot of my time on sales and marketing mm -hmm. which is what we're here to talk about um, mm -hmm. today and uh, you know once I get the clients on board I then work with a number of other translators obviously depending on the on, on the project um, so I would hire other translators to do to do the actual translation I, I do some review work myself um, but mostly my job is the coordination if you like I'm kind of a sales manager project manager that kind of thing Mm. So then uh, you're probably <laughs> one of the best people to talk about marketing and uh, looking for translation clients. 
Well, I don't know about uh, one of the best people, but it's certainly one of it's certainly one it's certainly one of my passions. It's yes. certainly an area. And, and that I, this that I is love. something this is something you do for the most for mostly mostly in your translation company. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You, Dmitry is coming back. <laughs> Would you say? Um, Hi hey. guys. Yeah, what was that? <laughs> I don't know. Something to okay. me. Live television. <laughs> what can I say? This yeah. stuff happens. Uh, actually, I paused a recording when uh, okay mm -hmm. I lost connection. So I'm not sure if it's. I'm gonna I'm gonna resume now. So <laughs> sorry, okay, guys. Go ahead. <laughs> no problem. Right. Using traditional marketing or using new methods like online uh, communities or social media. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's a massive question i think it's a very very good yes. question and uh, i would say that we have a we have a balance i i couldn't tell you exactly what that balance is but i would say that it's probably slightly more towards online marketing these days and and mm -hmm. that is in some ways where i think it's going however there's nothing quite like the personal connection so when i have a local client here that says hey we've got this project and I, I would say straight away, you know, can I come in the office, uh, come into your mm. office and uh, can we talk about it face to face? That's that's a, a fantastic way of 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 making a connection. So. So, yeah, I think there always will be that balance. But we've certainly seen a big shift towards online over the last 10 years com compared to what it was before. So. And where are the clients uh, based where they are based? Mostly. Well, we have we have quite a lot of clients here in Colombia. Um, we mm -hmm. also have um, a lot of clients in the States and in Europe. So, um, again, that's something that has changed since the beginning when we had really all the clients were here in Colombia. And now it, it, mm -hmm. it's really we've started to diversify and to have clients from other countries, which is great for a number of a number of different reasons, such as uh, different currency movements, for example. So, mm -hmm. so it's very good to have a diversified portfolio of clients. I would say, yeah, sure. and something that we're trying to uh, improve on all the time. Uh, what about your other areas of expertise? You also doing podcasts, you know, doing webinars, uh, and of course, you probably have to promote those as well. Uh, do you mostly use online tools, and what kind of uh, strategies do you use to promote your? Uh, uh, courses and other other stuff like that well i think i think yeah the the online world is something that i've become very interested in over the last few years not just from the business point of view but sort of a personal a personal branding point of view connecting with people things like this blab and i've got involved in in webinars i've produced uh, digital audio uh, product and and things like that so it's a slightly different uh, line if you like and mm -hmm. uh, those those things are promoted um exclusively online using um, social media, using social media scheduling tools, which I think are very useful. Um, I've recently been using uh, Meet Edgar, which is very good because it, it sort of helps you to schedule your your posts and it, it doesn't ever run out, which I think is um, fantastic. Uh, Facebook, of course, very good. The groups that, that, that exist within Facebook specialist um, translation groups that you can get involved in. So that's a, a nice place to hang out and uh, interact with, with other, other translators. And um, yeah, just, just really any, anything online. LinkedIn, of course, is another, another good one. I've made, met, met, made some great connections via LinkedIn um people that uh you know you just just don't you just don't really realize or i didn't realize before that these people existed and there's some great people out there doing sometimes some very similar things in a completely different part of the world and sometimes just to get together online for a few minutes and share ideas is something really quite nice because i think when you work you know i don't know that many people that do uh, something similar to me here in Bogota, Colombia. Of mm -hmm. course, there are some people that do do similar things, but but there aren't. There isn't a sort of community of people. But online, you will find that community. So I think that's mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah, it's a great thing because uh, Dmitri often <laughs> says that <laughs> not uh, all translators have an opportunity to uh, communicate with their peers offline. Well, mm -hmm. I'm one of them, for example, because, of course, there are a lot of English to Russian translators, and uh, they are also in uh, the city where I live, in Nizhny Novgorod. But um, 
I would say that the majority of them are using uh, probably old fashioned marketing and uh, they are not online. Or probably they are online, but I haven't met them online because uh, I mainly communicate with people from all over the world, but uh, very few of them are from Russia and even fewer are from Nizhny Novgorod. I would say Pro basically none of them. So yeah, yeah a community yeah. and the feeling of community is something I missed and didn't understand that I was missing that until yeah last year, basically. Yeah, yeah I that's think it's why like, I'm building the open mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think I think it's fantastic, yeah. but I think also it, it should be um, taken with a certain you know a certain measure, if you like, and mm -hmm. that and that is that whilst it you know I love talking to you guys, I love um, you know sharing mo you know spaces like this, and and please you know if ever, if everyone's got sort of uh, any questions, then please you know get get on the chat box because I think that's the whole idea of having yes. this interactive space with other translators and interpreters. But there is something that we should remember from a marketing perspective, and that is who are our clients so where where do they hang out and not yep. just focus on translation groups because someone who you know if you just now now i'm not saying that you can't get business from translation groups because absolutely you can and i know that people recommend um colleagues and so on so it's always very good to have um colleagues uh, with whom you can work but i think the majority of business does come from elsewhere um, at least in my case, comes from um, businesses, comes from multinational companies and so on. And therefore, I think it's worth remembering that we should be spending at least some of our time targeting those particular specific markets. And how can we target them exactly? How do you target your uh, ideal customers? Okay, well, that's a very, very good point. Another broad question. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I think the first thing you said is, uh, how do you target your ideal customer? And I think that's exactly it. That's exactly it. First, the first step is to identify your ideal customer, and it's for me, it's it's very different because I have different lines of business. So, for example, the um, the students or the the people who become our students in terms of learning English are very different to the translation the ideal translation clients and they and we have different ways of targeting each um, sector or each group of people so i think that's very very important to identify um, who it is that you're targeting and then how do we go about it well i, I would generally divide it up into online and offline which is something that we've 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 mentioned already and then within each um within each uh side online and offline div subdivide it into different strategies and then start giving them a go so let's say we start off with three online strategies and three offline strategies then we're going to divide our time and, and try all six of those strategies um some of them are going to work better than others so mm -hmm. this is a, a a sort of iteration process which is fairly logical in the sense that if something is working, you're going to try and do it more. And if something isn't working, you're going to either try and do it less or to stop it altogether. So if you put an advert in the newspaper and you don't get any responses at all, well, you might say, well, I was unlucky and you might just try it again, but probably you're going to say, well, that didn't work. That didn't work and yeah. stop it because I'm not going to throw my money away. So I'm now going to direct my marketing budget, whatever that might be, elsewhere so i think that it's it's very important to have this idea of measuring something or metrics very common in many businesses and i think that a freelance translator needs to see themselves as a business and needs to measure exactly what's happening so how much am i spending what results am i getting and then we're going to iterate so that would be kind of my general plan um, then how we set it up within that, well, I think if we start looking at online marketing, let's start with that first, um, mm -hmm. you would have a, a website is going to be really the key, a key component of your online strat or online marketing strategy. Um, you might also have pay-per-click ads and you might have, you know, other interactions. You might have, let's say, a LinkedIn strategy. So you might start off with those three strategies and offline you might start off with uh, networking with referrals and with some kind of old school poster advertising which again 
might sound a bit old school, but definitely can work in the right in the right way. So you've got these sort of strategies uh, set up. I mean, I don't know if you want to delve into any particular ones. There's so many out there, or if any of the viewers want to delve into any particular strategies. I, I don't know um, where you want to take the I've conversation got a from. Couple here. of questions um, returning to what you have just said. The first question uh, is, when do you know that something isn't working or you, you just weren't uh, lucky enough, as in your example with ads? So you start doing something. Uh, this is something that I've noticed that when I start doing something, it doesn't bring results right away. So it might take some time. Yep. Uh, how do you personally uh, see, how do you see that? How can you, how can you tell that it's... I, I, either it's not working or you haven't uh, put in enough effort or you haven't just been lucky enough this time and you might get lucky next time. That's the first one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure there's a, a good question, fantastic question, but I'm not sure there's a scientific answer to that, at least not in, in my case. Um, if, I, if I were doing something, let's say like Facebook ads, I would mm -hmm. try it for, let's say, give it one go, whether one mm -hmm. go might be, a four day advertising slot. And if I didn't get anything out of it at all, mm -hmm. I wouldn't dismiss it completely, but I would start to suspect that it's not working. Mm -hmm. I might give it another go. And if I do decide to give it another go, then definitely if it didn't work the second time, then then goodbye, you know, on to the next one, definitely. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't give it more than two chances because there are other good strategies out there. So I don't need sure. to keep plugging away with something that doesn't appear to be working. I'm going to switch into, into something else. Of course. It's, it's, yeah, go ahead. And how, how, do you, how do you identify strategies? How do you develop them? Uh, is it something you learn to take in courses or is it something you learn reading blogs? How do you develop strategy? Probably you got to have some knowledge, right? You got to understand uh, what kind of strategy you want to develop and how you want to apply it for your business. and this knowledge has to come from some place, somewhere, right? <laughs> so you, yeah, eventually, yeah, I, yeah. You, you're probably yeah. using your experience from working on a firm or maybe something else. Sure, I think experience uh, plays plays a part. You know, I've had different roles before I came to translation and, 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 and they definitely helped me to develop uh, in the areas of, of marketing and sales, that's for sure. However, I think that, that it, it's not that difficult. What Step one would be to identify a pool of potential strategies and step two would be to implement some of those strategies so they're, they're, they're different things so you say okay well one strategy might be a website how, how do I find out what available strategies there are S something as simple as typing in um, uh, small business marketing strategies into Google and you will find some great articles and you can read through those strategies write them all down on a piece of paper probably divide them up into online and offline and then start exploring them. Start reading another blog about what they are and what they involve. And there will be some strategies that you simply think, oh, that's not for me. And not all strategies work in all markets. So, you know, you're, you're not always going to, you're not always going to be in tune with what someone else is, is saying, but you might find two or three strategies that you think, hey, you know, I can do this. I can give these a go. And then you find out a little bit more about how to do them. So let's take the website. How do I set up a website? You know, and that, that would, and then you follow that process in order to get your strategy implemented. And then once it's set up, then you enter the monitoring stage, which is really to, to see if it's working or not. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I, I see it. I don't think there's any magic way. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of marketing strategies as I'm sure um, many, if not all of the all of the viewers are aware of some marketing strategies and over time you can add new marketing strategies onto that and uh, really refine in terms of which ones you think which ones you think are going to go to work mm -hmm. um, you mentioned good. websites yes we've got a question yeah. you mentioned websites and <coughs> we have a question uh, from Dauphine. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> uh, and it uh, concerns uh, websites. Uh, Dauphine asks, what about using free domains for our professional websites? I'm very comfortable with a free website I've created almost from scratch. Do you think it may look unprofessional to the client and that the web address bears a free domain apart from the name of my business? Um, 
Yeah, I don't. I, I, I don't think. Um, I don't think it's ideal. I don't think it's ideal to have um, a website that has you know some sort of free um, free component to it because I think some people will view that as uh, as looking um, unprofessional. So we're talking about something like I don't know blogspot dot you know dot the name of your company dot com. So it does. It doesn't seem to be entirely your company and i but but nevertheless it's not necessarily a bad way to start off so you know we're, we're not looking at perfection here if you've got a website that is up and running that is working that is attracting clients then that would be a solution and that could be a solution for the next six months it could be a solution for the next year however i would recommend that everyone migrates to their own website at some point that is you know could be their name.com or, or or the name of their company.com so i would suggest that's the way to go but if you've got an interim solution you've got a solution that's working at the moment then you know no need to panic and change it tomorrow um stick with what you've got and maybe look to improve that over time yeah and i, I think also it's a good know point. that uh, I also know that uh, free websites, uh, you can have, you can pay for a domain name at some free services like WordPress, or I don't know about Blogspot, but uh, at WordPress, you can definitely buy yeah. a domain. Yeah, I'm not sure if, if you'll get uh, a, a, an email address with that domain, but probably you will. And uh, yeah, it, it can also be, it can be the next step after having a, an entirely free WordPress site. Do you want to say something, Dimitri? <laughs> no, I think uh, Paul made a very good point about uh, starting at least somewhere, even if it's a free uh, domain name, uh, it's still a starting point and it still will, will help you to start building something, building towards your business goals. So uh, don't get discouraged if you only have a free domain name and other translators have a professionally designed websites. At least you you, you start it so and you can uh, analyze where, where you want to go next and then find probably a hosting company or uh, uh, read some, some more information about building a website for yourself. Uh, I personally uh, think there is nothing difficult about building a website for your business. Uh, uh, it's something you can learn while just reading articles and watching videos. I built myself uh, my, my personal website, uh, uh, the open mic, uh, Blabbing Translators website, and a couple more other websites that are no longer in use. So, and I didn't have any, any kind any kind of web design knowledge. Uh, two or three years ago, I didn't understand what the domain name was. I didn't understand what hosting was. <laughs> I, I didn't know all those things. And I think uh, important point here that uh, marketing and uh, promoting your business online takes a lot of learning. So uh, you, you have to invest uh, in, in your business and you have to learn new things. And if you, you want to take it to the next level, uh, you got to read, you got to read, you got to read, you got to watch videos, you got to listen to other people's and you got to take this advice on board and try, try to gradually implement it and uh, help your business grow absolutely absolutely i mean you can certainly you can certainly learn how to to do all of this stuff and you can certainly improve at things over time i think um, the most important thing is is your website generating new leads is it generating yep. new business in whatever state it is at the moment and i say in whatever state because i can guarantee that all of my websites at the moment need improving <laughs> um, better than they were, but they still need improving. And when I look back, um, you know, over the last 10 years, some of the websites that I had at the beginning were absolutely terrible. You know, if I could see them again now, they would, I would, you know, <laughs> be really, really embarrassed. However, they did bring in business. They did bring in leads. And I did get clients as a result of having that website. So, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't all bad. So, you know, I would encourage you to look at it from the, from the business aspect you know is 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 your it's not just about having a website up so you can say to people hey i've got a website and it's www.whatever.com it's about does that website generate business for you does it generate leads who is seeing your website where where, where is it being distributed where is it being shared and um, are people interacting with you as a result of you having that website up and running
And what are some strategies to attract uh, those leads and those people who could share your site to your website? I know there are lots of strategies, but could yeah. you name yeah, top great. three that you use? <laughs> great, great question. <laughs> great question. Well, let's start with um, let's start with uh, what people are going to do when they actually get to your website, which I know is not quite your question, but let's. I, I think that's very important okay. as well. So, so when people look at your website, and if um, what do they see on the screen? Let's say without scrolling down. So, what is uh, referred to as above the fold? What do they actually see on your website? And what I would um, encourage people to have there is a call to action. In other words, a button or something that draws people in, that makes them want to do something. A typical example would be a contact us button or a free quote button. What do you want people to do when they get to your website? Because I would suggest what you don't want them to do is simply to have a look around um, as if they were having a cup of coffee and, uh, and then leave. You want them to have a look around, <laughs> feel relaxed, have a cup of coffee, and then ask you something and then show interest in in carrying out some kind of business deal with you which in in most cases is going to be hey can you translate my documents for me that that would be you know and and if you want them to do that make it easy for them you know people people won't bother um looking for your phone number if it's just in one tiny thing at the bottom of the site they they need there needs to be a button that says hey contact me now and and we need to make it easy for people so i think that's one key point focus on what to do when people get to the site in terms of how to get people to site to the site well many many strategies let's start with um let's start with search engine optimization so you need to write content that is interesting and you need to write great content that people are going to be attracted to so this the the google algorithm the search engines they're all, they're all looking for great content so write great content don't just put up a really simple static website i always favor the kind of website that has a static part so let's say home about us services all that kind of thing and then at the bottom it has a blog that's great because you're adding new content on a periodic basis. And that should be every week, every fortnight. If you can't do it any more than every month, at least do it once a month. Add a new article. Um, add some news about you. If, you. if you've got a certification, if you've just passed um, the ATA certification exam, for example, put it up as a blog post. If you've just attended a conference, put it up there on, on, on your blog. Um, write content that is attractive to your clients. So I think content marketing is, is very important. And when you've written a great blog post, um, as many of you are great writers, a lot of translators are fantastic writers, of course. So you write a great blog post, don't just leave it on your website, try and draw people into it. Well, how do you do that? One way, for example, is posting it on Twitter, or on Facebook, or on any other social media, LinkedIn. So you're putting a link to your blog post, and if it's interesting, if it's got a great title, great titles, of course, are really, really important in terms of the content, then it's going to draw people in. They're going to click on that link. And where are they going to end up? They're going to end up on your website. So that's that's one way of drawing people in to continually release new content. You can also look at the actual setup of your page itself. And I recommend that people use WordPress. It's something that's very um, easy to use. You can add your own content. And there's also a number of plugins that you can use, such as the Yoast SEO plugin. And it makes it incredibly easy. You don't need to be a programmer. You don't need to be a computer expert by any means. You simply add the tags and the titles and the keywords that you want to use which might be, for example, you know, best translator, best French translator, or best French translator in London. You know, what is your key? What is your unfair advantage? That's a term that I that I really like. What is your unfair advantage? What is it that makes you special compared to all of these other translators around the world? And you know, highlight those differences. Are you are you the best? Um, French to English medical translator based in wherever. Well, if you are, then promote that, promote that in your keywords, promote those, the, 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 those terms in your content and share that with people to, to get the word out. So that's a little bit on SEO. The other one that's worked very well for me is PPC or pay per click advertising. Now, most people don't like the first word 
um, in that PPC. Pay, it means you have to pay. <laughs> and I can... Nobody, Nobody likes, likes to, pay. to pay. I don't like to pay. Um, and I can understand that. I can understand that perfectly. But, um, you know, I had a... I had a I had a coaching client not 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 long back and and he said well actually you know you pay for everything you pay to go to conferences you pay to you know even to go to a meeting with someone you every kind of marketing that you do really you're going to pay for so actually pay per click is not that bad it, it it's you know you're going to be paying for everything and normally what you're paying is cents you might be paying 50 cents for a particular click and what, how does this work? Well, you sign up for an account um, for a, a, a Google a Google Ads account, let's say, and you type in certain keywords, let's say best French translator in London, the best French translator medical or whatever it is that you, you are. And w when people type in those words, your website is going to come up at the top of the Google search listings. People are going to click on that. You're going to pay for that, but hopefully you're going to get much more money back in terms of the clients that you're going to acquire. So pay-per-click advertising is another one that can work. What's the difference? Well, pay-per-click advertising um, costs money, but doesn't really take that much time once you've set it up. Mm -hmm. Something like content marketing effectively is free, but it's going to take you, you know, a considerable amount of time to write the articles and to post the articles. So you know, what's the best strategy? A lot of the experts out there will say it's best to use a combination. Um, sometimes the organic results can be even more powerful than the paid results. And, you know, why not, if, if, if you're just starting out, why not go for the organic results? In other words, write great content, share great content. And as Dimitri said right at the beginning, you know, who are you writing this content for? Don't just write random content really write with a particular person in mind and write for that one person, write for that person and then get that content out there. So that's a... Do you think uh, translate, translators should focus on writing content that is going to be read by translators or by clients? Because a lot of translators in our industry, they, they write blog posts uh, mostly targeted at fellow translators. That's why we have the open mic and it's quite successful right now, right? Because people love sharing uh, tips and people love sharing experiences with their peers, but it's good for uh, promoting a, a user engagement and uh, in terms of uh, building an audience within your uh, peer group that can particularly refer clients to, to you uh, if they know you from your reading, which happened to me quite a lot of times. People uh, read my blog, people uh, can connect with me on an emotional level, people uh, love what I'm saying, what I'm talking about in my blog post, and they effectively they refer clients to me because they connected with me from my from my writings. So, uh, but do you think it would be more preferable to write uh, content targeted at clients, how you can solve their problems and how you can help them with their business in the specific niche you're working in? Again, well, fantastic, fantastic question, question Dimitri. I, and, it, and one to which I don't think there is uh, a single correct answer. But what I would encourage people to do is to do it in accordance with a strategy. In other words, don't just start ran writing blog posts at random have a strategy what is your strategy who are you going to be writing for it's all very well to write for peers for other translators it builds a sense of community and it most of the time it will get you uh, additional work if you become a voice of some authority in the industry people are likely to ask you to help them with projects or to refer work to you so in that sense i think it's it's good um nevertheless i would probably suggest that people do write um, more for clients. I've seen um, a couple of blog posts recently that are aimed specifically at clients, at explaining. Uh, one of the issues that we seem to have that I think most people are in agreement with within this industry is that we have this sense that clients don't understand us, that clients don't get it, that clients don't get the work involved in a translation project. And, you know, I would agree with that to a large extent. If that's the case, therefore, then perhaps we should be focusing a number of our efforts on educating clients and potential clients. And so, yes, I would say in general, probably we want some more stuff for clients out there. Yeah, so uh, I guess 
preferable solution would be have some sort of a combination of topics. Yeah, that seems to be the answer in all of these things. A, a combination, a combination. Yeah, yes. yeah. We solved it. Yeah, but you see, but you see, but you see, if you do start with a combination, you can then refine it. So let's say you write fifty percent of blog posts for clients and fifty percent of blog posts for translators. You know, over time, you can measure, you can get a feel for how many people are reading each of those blog posts. And if you discover that the ones that you write for clients are being read by three times as many people, well, you you might decide just to write exclusively for clients. So starting with a combination in any any of these strategies, it's the same with online marketing and offline marketing. Well, if I start off with 50-50, um, I can see where it goes over time and then I can refine my strategy. And it might be that a 75-25 strategy works better, but I, I don't know that at the beginning. Yeah. You mentioned some of the things that uh, some of the strategies, strategies that you use for online marketing and what are some of the old school marketing methods that you find helpful? Well, I do, like, I do love the old school marketing methods as well. And I also love the term um, guerrilla um, marketing, mm. this idea that you can uh, just sort of go out and about in your local community normally and really try and interact with people so you might have um you might have some branded pens or some notebooks mm. or something and you might leave them in strategic places you might uh, if you're a, if you do a bit of editing work you might sneak into a university and stick a um a notice um up on the notice board or you might not even have to sneak in you might ask someone if you can uh, use their notice board to to place a targeted advertisement you might advertise in a trade journal for example, if you're a medical translator, you might advertise where you think your target market will be hanging out. You might um, talk to your current clients about getting referrals. You might uh, get involved in some networking events. For example, let's say you are involved in, you, you, you do technical translations in, in the world of engineering. Well, get yourself along to an engineering conference. You'll probably be one of the only translators there, if not the only translator. If you have <laughs> some business cards that say specialist engineering translations on or something like that, then I'm sure you can meet some interesting people. So those are some of the kind of offline. I like the term old school. Um, but I think it, it reflects what, what, how it works. I mean, another one that people talk about is cold calling. Most people hate cold calling, of course, mm -hmm. but it does work. It does work. And if you have the opportunity even to work with, you know, a partner or family member or something and someone to make some calls for three or four days, why not give it a go? You might get some, some good business out of that strategy. It might work for you. Of course, you need to be careful with cold calling. It's not legal in every marketplace. So you need to check that before you get started. But you know, some of these strategies, these old school strategies do work really well. You know, there are people who will put a simple, um, a simple advertisement, a, a poster, you know, a, a, even an A4 um, printout up on a notice board in a university. And if, if that's the right type of market for you, if you do a certain type of editing work, let's say, you can get clients from that. And once you've got two or three clients, they're going to refer you to more. So, you know, it really, it really does depend, but it's well worth including those strategies as well. Of course, I should say it depends. Again, that's one of my favorite, fa favorite <laughs> phrases. It depends where you live. If you live in London, your offline marketing strategy is likely to be significantly different to if you live in a remote village. So it's probably worth, you know, keeping, keeping that in mind. Um, before you go to a huge effort. And this is where, you know, there's no exact science to it. You've just got to weigh up what you think is going to work for you. You've got to have your best guess. If you're going to select three online strategies and three offline strategies, what would be your best guess as to which ones are going to work for you in your marketplace? And then put them to the test. And then probably you're going to reject one of them and replace it with another one over time. I just want to remind our listeners that you can ask Paul questions. To do that, you have to. T you, you can type uh, slash Q uh, in the chat box below, and your question will appear uh, on the panel on the left hand side of the screen. Yeah, I was wondering, Paul, what kind of uh, old school uh, strategies have you used in your translation business? 
And what kind of experience did you have? Well, I've I've had I've had mixed experience. I've handed out flyers. I've put up uh, I've put up notices. I've even had I've got business um, from putting um, magnets on my car. Um, So you know, I think I I, and they've they've all worked um, in different uh, you know to a different degree. I think I think the the magnets on the car have worked fantastically well for a very low investment. I've got uh, thousands of dollars of business out of that. I should probably I should probably point out that most of that business has been um, for English classes rather than for translation. But you know, it's so again, it depends on the market. But it has been a very successful. Um, strategy for me. I think networking has been absolutely um, key. And again, a lot of that networking has come, interestingly for me, through different areas. So I do some voiceover work and then I will get in, you know, I'll get asked to do a voiceover job and then someone will say, well, hey, can you look at these texts? So I've got a number of clients uh, that way. I've got a number of clients for translation work through English classes um, because obviously they're aware that, that, that I'm in the business of languages. And then they will move on to translations. I think that's another thing. I think if you think about your clients, do they really understand the difference between a translator and interpreter? In many cases, not. And do they understand that everyone has a different role within this market? So, you know, an English teacher, a translator, an interpreter, and so on and so on. Often they don't. Often they see you as, in my case at least, perhaps in a more developed market um, such as New York, it it might be different. But in my case... They see me as a languages provider, which means that if I can get an in through any one of my business lines, then then I normally have the opportunity to offer them, you know, other other business lines. And yeah, I've tried uh, all sorts of things over the years. Uh, as I said, I've with with different degrees of success. I've I've sat in um, you know in Starbucks and places like that with uh, with computers with the stickers on the back of the computer, and you know, I just I just think it's. I think it's just worth it, worth having a worth having a go. If you're going to be out and about, I think you should promote your brand. If you believe in your brand, promote it. You know, if if you believe in yourself, then then go for it and market yourself in any in any way possible. Because sometimes you will get something that is just surprising. You know, you might be sitting next to someone on a plane, and you can go in the Facebook groups and you can see so many, read so many of these stories of how people. Um, you know, get in touch with um, clients. I was also part of a business networking group for a while, and I got quite a few clients through that. So, you know, there's many, many different opportunities. And I think it also, um, in my view, you know, I like doing different activities. I don't like sitting at home all day. I like getting out and about once in a while, meeting people, talking to people. And just through having those conversations, you can open up new business. And I, and I think that's a good way to start as well with a conversation, not necessarily with, you know, uh, hi, I'm Paul. And would you like a translation? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, more like, you know, hi, hi, I'm Paul. And, and what do you do? You know, talk mm. about what that person does. And, and, and the more that they talk, the more you can start thinking about how they might have some potential language needs, which you might or might not be able to to help them with at some point. So it's all about establishing a initial connection with the person, whatever it's online or offline and trying to build a relationship first rather than jumping at the opportunity and started selling right away. Absolutely. I mean, the old uh, sales uh, thing is no like and trust. Um, someone will buy from you when they know you, when they like you and when they trust you. And that doesn't happen instantly. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you phone someone up and say, you know, hi, my name's Paul, and would you like to buy a translation? Um, it's not going to work. You need to establish, you know, the modern way of selling is to establish someone's needs first. You know, I have people that phone me up and try and sell me stuff, and I'm they don't even know whether I'm interested in it or not. They have no idea. As soon as I answer the phone, they're trying to sell it to me. You need this. Will you buy this? It's the offer lasts today only. Buy it now. They have no idea what my needs are. <laughs> if you're talking to a client, the way to get business is to establish what you can help them with. You know, how could I help your business? What's the most difficult part? Um, that w- what are the difficult, some of the difficulties that you have in your business? How do you reach new markets, for example? Those kinds of questions that are really going to get the kind of answer that you're looking for from the client. And once you hear that answer, you might think, well, hey, 
you know, I can help you reach a new market because, you know, if you're looking to expand into Latin America, I can help you. Or if you're looking to, um, you know, open up these new markets in Europe, I can help you, whatever it might be. And then what, when you're in a position of understanding, you really are giving that person a solution. Remember, selling has this hugely bad image. You know, I'm knocking on the door. The person's opening up on the door. I've got a vacuum cleaner in my hands and I'm, you're, you want that you do want this vacuum cleaner. You know, it shouldn't be like that. It should be, you know, tell me about your needs and then I will provide you with a solution that fits your needs. And if you can do that, you're not really selling. You're not pushing something on someone. You're, you're providing them with a solution that they want. And I think if we can remember that, we'll, we'll sell lots more. Do you think that building relationships yep. online and offline differs in some ways or is it can you can you basically use the same principles in both contexts? Yeah, good question Elena. I think um well I think there's a lot of principles in common for sure. Um I think um online is different. I think you can do lots of business online. I think people's um level of trust depending on the country that you're in is, is different. You know, in some countries, people are still a little bit apprehensive about paying by credit card online, for example. So, you know, the trust situation is not always the same, but you can still get to know people online. You can still um, get to like people online and you can still get to trust people online. So yeah, absolutely. It can be done for me. There's still nothing like going in, you know, putting my suit on, going into a, a big client, um, going into the boardroom, shaking everyone's hand and uh, delivering a personalized presentation. That's still, um, you know, you know, I really enjoy doing that. And I think it creates a connection that is difficult to, um, you know, get the same connection, exactly the same connection online. So, you know, and meeting people at a conference again, it is difficult to replicate that connection online. But, you know, we can do lots of, we can do lots of business online. It comes back again to the combination. Let's do some business online. We, we've got these markets. Why limit ourselves? You know, if you're a translator living in wherever, you have the opportunity to get business online and you have the opportunity to get business offline. So why not go for both? You know, that's, that's my view on it. Uh, do, do you, can you give some sort of a advice to people who are just starting out in this profession who fresh out of college or who doesn't have much of the experience, how they can market themselves? Where should they start? Okay, well, I think um, a couple of ideas spring to mind. I think the first one is to get a decent website up and running. So get a decent website, make it make it clear who you are. And, you know, I see sort of translator websites sometimes. And I think if you are an individual freelance translator, that should be clear from your website. Perhaps it would make sense to have a, a photo of yourself on your website, you know, um, what services do you offer? Be clear about the types of services that you offer. I like the, um, there's a couple of websites out there. I like if you go to uh, linguagreca.com, for example, you will see one of the things that they say on their website is it's all about Greek. It's all about Greek. And it has a, a list of a couple of language pairs there, but it's very clear the services that they offer. So be clear who you are and, and, and set up a nice, clear, easy to understand website. That would be um, one recommendation. The other recommendation would be to network. I think, um, I think networking is just hugely important. So network, get yourself onto LinkedIn, get a good profile on LinkedIn, connect with people, start asking people questions and uh, start talking to agencies about jobs that they might have, start talking to direct clients about how you might be able to help them and really just build up a network and say to people, hey, I'm here, I'm ready to go and, um, you know, get started that way. So I would say um, also, you know, face-to-face um, -face networking if you get a chance, but I would say a website and networking. Website and networking. Uh, wonderful tips, uh, wonderful advice for young translators. I think networking is a very important part of our lives, especially when you're just young and when you're just starting out. You gotta meet other people of your profession. You gotta find the peers. You gotta uh, talk to people from your profession and learn from them, and maybe even find a mentor. Right? 
Yeah, I think oh, I, one thing I do love about this industry is that there's people always out there willing to help. So, you know, it, it's um, I think a lot of people when they when they start off, they have this idea that, you know, someone who's two years further down the track or five years or 10 years or 20 years is going to be this person, you know, who's difficult to, to, to get hold of. And my experience is that it's not like that at all. If you ask someone a question, they will normally be really, really helpful. So, you know, like you said, look for a mentor, someone, you know, a formal could be a formal situation. The ATA, for example, has a, a mentor program. Um, or it can just be or in an informal way. You can just ask people questions and, you know, nine times out of 10, at least they will help you and they will point you in the right direction because people generally like to help. And if someone says, hey, can you give me a hand with this? Most people are going to say, sure. So absolutely get out there, ask people, ask people to point you in the right direction. That's been actually my experience too, because uh, when I started uh, getting out more and uh, talking to other translators at the moment, it's online. I, I, I no one ever, uh, did, no one ever said that they don't want to help me. And that it was the same with this blaming translators project because I'm in charge of mostly um, in charge of contacting uh, our guests and everyone is very supportive. So yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> That's uh, a great advice to just to go out and ask for help. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We are very amazing <laughs> people. <laughs> <We're> great. <laughs> Translators <laughs> are awesome. Yeah. So uh, it's been almost an hour. So uh, if you guys have any questions whatsoever, uh, feel free to ask them uh, in a chat window and Paul and we will be happy to answer them. Uh, Paul shared some amazing advice, uh, very actionable tips, uh, uh, especially about establishing your marketing strategies. I love that a lot. Thank you so much, Paul, for uh, sharing this. Uh, guys, if you have any other questions, yes, uh, have, feel free we to. We have a couple of minutes yeah. to ask them. You can do it uh, by typing slash q in the chat box and your question will appear on the left hand side uh, panel on the screen yeah we've got a couple of comments i'm just trying to keep up with all the comments here we've got uh, christelle <laughs> at coach for tran um it says uh, who, who, are, who are your ideal clients which is very important but she goes on to say what is their preferred communication style and i think that that's a that's a good one as well some some people these days just prefer communicating um, via email they feel comfortable with that and um, other people um, prefer to talk on the phone for me the phone is a a magical uh, sales tool i think the phone is really important and then for others they really want to have a meeting they really you know, they they really want you to go into their office. And of course, that's not always possible, depending on um, where in the world your client is. But some people are looking for that kind of connection. So if you can identify, um, if you can identify, as uh, as Christelle says, their preferred communication, um, you know, route, then then that's going to help you in terms of connecting with them. Yep, absolutely. Uh, we have another question from uh, yes. Delphine. Uh, I'm going to read it out. out loud. How did Paul get into marketing? Does he, oops, sorry. Does he offer marketing consulting services for translation clients as valued added service? Uh, for, for, for translation, so, sorry, could you say that again, Dimitri? Uh, that, do you offer marketing consulting services for your translation clients as a value added service? I would say, um, it's it's a very interesting question and probably a very timely question. It's certainly something that I've been looking at and it's not something that we actively do at the moment, but it is something that, that I'm very interested in. I'm very interested in the world of digital marketing. And I also think from a translator's point of view, it's very interesting if you can develop your services. If we're talking about an unfair advantage, if you are a translator, then that's great. You can provide that service. But if you can combine that with another area, whether it's marketing or SEO or editing or anything else, then I think that helps you to achieve another level of differentiation. And so, um, so yeah, it's certainly something that we are looking at at the moment if we can expand our offering. So I hope that 
I got a couple of our comments. In a marketing course, I heard your ideal client is a paying client. Very bottom line type of thinking. <laughs> the ideal, the ideal client is a paying client. Um, <laughs> well, well, I think it, you know, I think it, I think uh, it depends. It depends exactly what what sort of uh, marketing, what what sort of area you're in. Um, but I think it, I think there's no shame in having one eye on the bottom line. And I think we're all trying to build successful, sustainable businesses. And, you know, money is a key component of that, as is cash flow and, you know, some of these other sort of accounting metrics. So I think it's important to have an idea, you know, how much you're going to charge. Don't undervalue yourself and um, and, and, and make sure you get paid for doing a fantastic job. And apart from getting paid for doing a fantastic job, make sure that whatever your client pays you is going to be an absolute bargain. I'm not talking in terms of a price per word or anything like that, a bargain in terms of the work that they pay um, you to do is going to help them really springboard forwards in their business. So they're going to see whatever they invested in, let's say translation work as an absolute bargain because it's going to help them to reach new markets. We have a question from uh, Parvati. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I'm saying that often today. <laughs> What's your opinion on LinkedIn versus pay-per-click? Uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn advertising versus pay-per-click. I'm guessing, or just, or just using, or just using LinkedIn. I mean, if we're if we're talking about using um, LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn without actually paying for the advertising then i think that's a great way to get started um pay-per-click obviously does involve paying um pay-per-click on if we're talking about um google ads versus paid linkedin ads i don't actually have any experience with using linkedin paid linkedin advertising so i can't really comment on that google ads has worked um very well for me um and i think um i think it just depends on your 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 own particular market as we've said several times already get started with something don't get overloaded um you know don't it's not necessarily that the one strategy is going to you know we need to compare all of these strategies right at the beginning we can't st it's just too much we need to start with one go for it and and see if it works so I probably haven't, uh, Parvati. I probably haven't perfectly answered your question there, but uh, but yeah, LinkedIn paid advertising, not much experience. LinkedIn is a platform in general, very very good, of course, and PPC does also also work depending on your market. We have a question about LinkedIn from Barry. She's asking, how do you recommend connecting to a prospect on LinkedIn if you haven't had any previous contact? Um, offer value, offer value first, I think, is um, to, to you know, make the connection. And obviously, once you've made the connection, then the next step, what the next step should not be <laughs> is, hi, I'm Paul, and would you like to buy a translation? The next step should be to really share things with the client you know Tess Whitty is 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 a bit of an expert when it comes to LinkedIn she's got some great blog posts out there and, and so on so I would recommend that you look up some of um some of her stuff but um you know it's really it's about making connection sharing so let's say you're connecting with um a client in the oil and gas industry and you find a, a particular article that you think might be of interest to them well you share that article with them are you getting paid for that no you know, you're, you're providing value. Once you've provided value on a number of occasions, then is probably the moment, you know, and you might then ask them, um, not directly, would you like to buy something, but you might ask them to explain their needs. Or you might even say, hey, can we just get on the phone for 10 minutes? I've just got a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you and just ask them in general about their industry and about their particular needs. And you might then get sales from that further down the line but it is a gentle approach you know everyone hates even though people do it all the time nobody likes the situation where someone just connects with you and then the next thing they're saying hey buy this it just seems it just seems you know it's too much too soon it's uh you know it needs to be a sort of gentle a gentle running yeah marked as spam <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 absolutely absolutely so yeah barrett i hope that i hope that helps a little bit and we have yet another question from Dauphine. Um, she's asking how much time should we devote to an in-person meeting with a potential client? Some colleagues suggest 30 minutes at most. What would you recommend? Um, 
I think it depends on the meeting and how and how well it's going. I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't limit it. I would normally book a meeting for 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 about an hour, and I would usually use less time than that. But I think it depends on how the meeting's going. Sometimes, sometimes you get into a meeting where the person just wants to get down to business pretty much immediately, and that's obviously going to result in a shorter meeting. Sometimes there's a bit of uh, get to know each other time at the beginning that might take ten minutes or so, and then you might sort of drift into uh, or, or turn that attention to sort of business matters as the meeting goes on. Of course, again, that depends on the, on the culture. Some cultures are a bit more, let's get down to business straight away. Others prefer to have more of a, a chat at the beginning and then get down to business, uh, business uh, issues. But I would really say it depends. You know, there shouldn't be a set time for, for, for these things. I mean, I know we have a set time here on, on the Blab today and we're, you know, you know, sometimes sort of society dictates that you should have a set time for things. But I think generally speaking, it should be as long as is needed. You know, don't go on and on. Sometimes I've had very successful meetings that have been about seven or eight minutes long and I've got the business and I've walked out there with the business and I've had other meetings that the same sort of thing of, of um, but about an hour. So it really just does depend. Yeah, it all depends on the client, I guess. Okay, Absolutely. we have we have just passed one hour mark and we're trying to keep our labs under one hour. <laughs> we usually don't succeed to do it because our guests always have so much things to share. And uh, Paul, first of all, I want to thank you that you accepted our invitation and joined us today. And I want to thank everyone who listened to us today and watched us live. Um, if you joined us uh, later then at uh, 4 p.m. GMT, uh, you probably missed something, but don't worry. You can go to blabbingtranslators.com, subscribe to our newsletter, and uh, you will get the recap of this blab together with, with show notes, the audio and video recordings on, on Sunday. We usually send them on Sunday. Don't forget to share yeah. this blab the, and the recordings with your friends and colleagues and i hope to see you next wednesday yeah thank you so much for joining guys and have a great day thank you Paul. Thank yeah you. thanks very much and yeah sorry i haven't sort of replied to everyone in the, the comments i haven't managed <laughs> to keep up but yeah it's been a great experience thanks yeah. dimitri thanks elena and uh thanks to all of you all the best thank you very much yeah hopefully to see you sometime yes. again <laughs> okay all right thanks guys okay. all right bye. have a good day everyone thanks <laughs> bye